This is what I call 30,000 foot level reporting. So we're looking at the view of the Earth from a high level view like an airplane. We're not getting into all the details. To make sure we're all on the same page, I want to use an illustration of what 30,000 foot level reporting is. Consider the time it takes to commute from home to work. Is it going to take you the same amount of time to the second every day? Well, obviously not. Why? We're going to have delays more at one day than the other for our traffic signals. We go faster another day, one day than the other, and so on. So let's consider it takes us 25 to 35 minutes. That's considered to be common cause variability. Now, if it takes us an hour one day, we can talk about that particular point as special cause. Maybe we had inclement weather or we had a major traffic accident. But we really have no rights to talk about all the ups and downs excursions within common cause variability. But let's say we want to improve it. So now if it's 32 minutes, uh, or if yeah, 32 minutes is our goal. So if it's 33 minutes, we'll say, what happened? We did not meet our goal. It's 29 minutes. We say, well, boy, I've met our goal. But I just said we shouldn't do that because the goal that we set is within the common cause region. That happens all the time in red, yellow, green scorecards. So we get trigger in between red and green when it's common cause variability. If you got common cause variability and you don't like the answer, you've got to change the process. So let's consider we wanted to go in and leave a half an hour earlier to see if that made a difference to our commute time. Now we discover it takes us 18 to 22 minutes. So we reduce not only the average value, but also the variability. So the point is, is if we got common cause variability, we don't like the answer from a 30,000 foot level point of view, we got to change the process. But Traditional scorecards don't really separate special from common cause variability. So let's look at this uh, red, yellow, green scorecard in a little bit more detail. Keep in mind, whenever things turn red, we're supposed to get somebody to work on it. What can happen? We can lead to firefighting. In addition, it doesn't make any futuristic statement. So let's instead looking at, look at this chart using an individual's chart. Now, people will say, well, this is just normal statistical process control. Well, it's using one of the tools, but it's using them differently. So I am taking samples using an individual's chart where the control limits are calculated from variability between subgroups. So I won't use an X bar and R chart, P chart, or U chart because the control limits are calculated by the kind of the variability in the case of the X bar and R chart within subgroups. So that's somewhat of a big deal. So I can send you an article that describes what I'm talking about and why X bar and R charts can be deceiving if you'd like and I'll make reference to my email address at the end of this session. But for now I'm using an individual's chart to calculate the limits. Now you notice that I have not exceeded the upper or lower control limits and I don't really have a trend relative to those limits. So I get a quite different picture than the red, yellow, green scorecard relative to what's happening in the process. Now, if you've got a process that's stable like this, which has indicated there has been no improvements to the process, then we can go in and say our process is stable, hence it is predictable. So I can start looking out the windshield of the car instead of drive my car looking at the rear view mirror, which can be rather hazardous, obviously. Looking out the windshield, if I don't like what I see, i got to apply my brakes or turn the steering wheel, not unlike a process improvement project. So the next obvious question is, what do you predict? So what we're going to do is take the data from the recent region of stability, and we're going to build the distribution. So that's the distribution of what I expect in the future. I'm going to turn that distribution on its side. The 2.2 value represents a frequency of a time that I believe we're going to have red, not only now, but in the future. Now, we may also have distributions that are not normally distrib distributed. For example, we might have transactional time where we can buy, be bounded by zero. So calculating that area can be 
somewhat uh, not trivial. So I prefer to use a probability plot that to represent the distribution of the data. And what we can do is basically calculate the capability of the process using the vertical axis, which represents percent less than, to get that area. So what have we concluded from this illustration? That our process is stable. We've got about a 32.6% common cause uh, indication of issues. So now, if we look at how we might examine this data differently, it's kind of a two-step process. The first process is to look at the state if process is stable. Then if it is, what we're going to do is do a probability plot when we've got continuous data. We'd like to make a statement so everybody can understand how the process is performing. And we put a statement below that says it's a predictable process with about a 32.6% issue. So we're making that statement not only now, but that's what we expect in the future. That's only an estimate. Now we've got some um, add-in to Minitab statistical software that can create these charts automatically. So if you enter that data, then you would get this uh, value. And what I'm suggesting is this is the kind of reporting we'd like to do for our metrics within our organization if we're looking at the output of the process. But you could also go in and have it as dashboards too without the, throughout the organization. And I'm suggesting it can give you better behaviors than the red, yellow, green scorecards. I call this 30,000 foot level reporting, which can I, I'm suggesting can lead to the right behaviors. Now what happens if you have a, don't have a specification? Well, if you've gone through Lean Six Sigma training, they'll often say, well, you've got to go in and establish something so you can calculate the capability. What I'm suggesting, if you don't have a specification, don't force it. Report out the median value and 80% frequency of occurrence. So you can get those values quite easily from a probability plot if you've got continuous data, where now we come off the vertical axis where you got 10, 50, and 90. 90 minus 10 is obviously 80. So you can automatically go in and put this uh, report out at the bottom of your chart. Oh, incidentally, this is taking one of the data sets from that table of numbers. So you can see how we can get so much more information than we can from just looking at a table of numbers. So what I'd like to have instead of this form of reporting, table of numbers, and what other scorecards we have, we use 30,000 foot level report outs. As I illustrated or mentioned earlier, I often have four different scorecards that I ask people on how they would interpret these scorecards. In every case, they give me option five, which is, says I cannot make any sense from them. So I believe we have an elephant in the room that nobody's talking about. The question is, is there a better way of having scorecards? And I'm suggesting there is, and that's 30,000 foot level reporting. I've given you an example of one application of 30,000 foot level reporting. I've got more, eight more examples that are on this particular uh, uh, website link. And I can give you that link if you ask me. And again, I'll be providing my contact information later. An add-in to Minitab is this EPRS-D that we can send you also if you would like to use it to create these charts. There's no charge for this add-in to Minitab. Again, this is a good way of creating 30,000 foot level report outs. Okay, now let's go in and start talking about how we can have this form of metric reporting throughout the organization. What I'm suggesting that you start with your value chain. This is what you do and how you measure what you do. The boxes that are connected with the arrows are the major things that occur in the organization. These are the major functions that you have. I'm using a hospital uh, value chain for an illustration. So for the first function, we'd have voice of the customer. Second was sales and marketing, deliver clinical service, invoice and collect. 
then report financials. IT, housekeeping, and so on are support functions. We'd like to also make this form of reporting clickable so it, things are automatically updated. So let's pretend we're clicking on this. If you notice, I've got two swim lanes. The top swim lanes are metrics relative to quality, cost, and time. The bottom swim lane is a flow chart or processes that we have that are aligned to the metrics that we have above. Basically, this is Y and this is X. Now, what often happens in organizations, we have people in the north wing of the building working on process documentation and improvement, and then people in the south wing of the building working on performance scorecards. And guess what? They don't talk to each other. The value chain here pulls it all together. So now our process documentation and improvement can become more a part of the overall business management system. So basically, using this value chain, we as Y as a function of X. Now, if we were to click on the metric, then we could have 30,000 foot level reporting. This case here, it's attribute, so we don't have a probability plot. I have an out of uh, control condition here, which I could examine. Or I might say, well, I'm just going to look consider it to be common cause variability. And our software can ignore it and consider and lump it together with the other metrics if you so desire. So the current process is predictable, and the estimated is that we have 5.3% nonconformance. That's what our wastage is. Now, if we don't like that answer, then we got to do something different to the process. What we don't want to have is that people talk about or ask the question about why is one particular value high and another value is low. That can lead to a lot of firefighting. So again, what I'm suggesting is 30,000 foot level performance reporting for the right behaviors. So let's go in now. Let's talk about how we might have improvement efforts so that the enterprise as a whole benefits. So if we drill down on one other aspect of the value chain, I've got something called enterprise performance management. Enterprise process management, excuse me. Now in this, I have a nine-step business system. The first step is the vision and mission. This describes what you do in the organization. Where are you going in your organization? The second step is your value chain. This describes what you do and how you measure what you do. So if you're a hospital, you do hospital things. You don't build bridges. So this is looking at basically, again, what you do and how you measure what you do. Satellite or financial metrics in 30,000 foot level or operational metrics. Step number three is analyze the enterprise. We want to look for bottlenecks. We want to look for how the customers perform. We want to look at our value chain metrics and see how things are actually performing. We then want to create smart, that specific, measurable, actual, relevant, time-based satellite or financial metric goals. Then we want to create strategies that are targeted that are aligned with financials. So I'm, I can remember one case I was um, walking through this road map and I got to this point and the, the management team I was talking to, uh, again in South America, said, gee was for us, we just did our strategy the other day. And it was aligned to the overall vision and mission. I said, well, don't you think it makes sense to really have more targeted strategies that align your financials? Maybe the best thing that you can do is reduce nonconformance rates to have better uh, financial profitability. That probably would not come out under most strategic planning sessions. So we want to create targeted strategies. And if possible, we want to identify high potential areas that lead to 30,000 foot level metrics. So we have goals that we want to have these. And if we're talking about nonconformance, we go in and start establishing nonconformance metrics that we want to improve. And we establish goals for those. And there's an owner of those metrics, and they're going to be asking for that project to get done. So that pulls to the creation of the project 
and in, in step number seven, we identify and execute these projects. Now, if we did a good job in step seven, we improved the procedures in step number two, which improved the 30,000 foot level metric, which improved the financial metrics or satellite metrics. Notice how this loops back to step three, so we have somewhat of a plan to check act on the enterprise as a whole. Now, if you recall, step number one of this nine step system is vision and mission. Step number two is your value chain. Step number three is analyze. Now, step number four, five, six, and seven are shown here. So, step four, if we went through the full value chain, we want to report monthly profit margins because if you look at the full value chain, it actually decreased because we had a competitor move into town. Now, how are we going to do that? That becomes step number five. We're going to increase monthly revenue. So, that involves marketing. So, now there's a marketing manager looking for their particular metric, which happened to be percentage you know, of the uh, market share. So they're going to be asking for that project to get done so that their metric actually moves to a higher level of performance. The next strategy would be improved customer satisfaction. So there's two areas we're looking at from a high potential area is housekeeping and patient transportation, which both of them are not achieving our objectives. One, uh, housekeeping actually uh, got worse when we went to uh, outsourced it, and patient transportation is still taking too long. But the point is, is there's going to be a, uh, an owner of these processes asking for the project to get done, and then finally reduce costs. We talked about deliver clinical services. We want to reduce wastage by 10% in 10 months. So now, traditionally with Lean Six Sigma, we go in and try to determine which projects we want to do to save the most amount of money we can. But a lot of times, these projects fall off of people's plates because they're not really aligned to the overall performance metrics of the enterprise as a whole. And that's what I'm really doing with this enterprise improvement plan, where now there's going to be a manager asking for this project to get done because they understand in order for them to have long-lasting uh, improvement shown for their process, their metrics are going to have to change to a new enhanced level of performance. So just to reiterate, the improvement projects are aligned to enter for enterprise performance metric improvement needs. So whenever a 30,000 foot level chart has a recent region of stability, the process is said to be predictable. If the prediction is not desirable, improvement efforts are needed to the process. In the IWE methodology, the approach to actually make improvement does not really matter. We want the metric to improve. So in this case, for wastage, which is one of the metrics that we looked at strategically, we show that this chart actually moved to a new enhanced level of performance. We set a goal to improve it by 10%, and it was achieved by this level of performance, or achieved by a particular improvement project. So again, the 30,000 foot level uh, charting uh, tells you when you actually made an improvement or you have statistical evidence or statistical indication that uh, something changed within the process. What I'm suggesting is if this methodology really makes sense to you, then you uh, owe it to your organization to uh, share what you've kind of learned here. And because what I'm suggesting is you don't want to have the kind of problems that these particular companies had. You know, and more recently, you know, we've also had accounting issues within companies and, you know, all sorts of peanuts issues. Uh, relative to uh, uh, safety and so on. So there's been a lot of situations that um, are have occurred in the news media, and a lot of it is because we don't have transparency of metric reporting. And what I'm suggesting this 30,000 foot level view, where we start looking at issues, and we then uh, they have um, they have a, a, a transparency because currently right now 
with our current reporting system, no one wants to be the bearer of the bad news when it goes up the executive chain. So a lot of times these metrics and issues that are occurring within the organization don't get highlighted like they should, and bad things can happen. Now, how might you try this methodology out? Well, I got a simple process for that. First, you download the free enterprise add-in that I have for Minitab so you can easily create these 30,000 foot level charts. And again, I'll give you that link, or I can send you that link if you so request. You then select one of your KPP performance indicators or other time series measurement to evaluate. You then create a 30,000 foot level chart. Compare the conclusion to the way you're currently reporting that particular metric. Share your comparison findings with others. Then if the 30,000 foot level metric needs to transition to a new level of performance, this is an opportunity for an improvement project. So I just want to revisit the learning objective for this session. Talked about performance metric report outs. So we can go in and have metrics that give us an indicate what might happen in the future if we don't do something different. We want to have whole enterprise metric performance reporting, ideally using these this form of reporting. Not going to happen tomorrow, but it's something that you might look at for down the road. And how do you have improvement efforts so the enterprise as a whole benefit? So what I'd like to do now is just go back to that video again. And now hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. Ford, can you turn that volume up for us? So hopefully that this session helped uh, give you some new insight to how you might look at your metrics differently. So as I promised, I'd give you my contact information. And if you uh, send me some uh, your, uh, your request, then I can also uh, send you a copy of the, the slides in a PDF format if you're interested. So Amy, we got do we have some questions? Yes, uh, Forrest, thank you for that presentation. I think we all uh, were able to learn a lot from that. Um, that's another topic that we get uh, webinars on very often. So um, thank you for that presentation. Um, anyone who has any questions, please submit them in the questions panel, and we'll uh, open those up for discussion. Um, I do have a couple of questions here already. Um, so the first question is, um, the data that you showed in your continuous response data example was normally distributed, um, but what can be done as far as non-normal data is concerned? Yes, with um, and non-normal data happens often when you've got uh, dealing with time, especially when uh, you can't have a negative time on executing a, a particular process, or maybe even the flatness of a part can't get below zero. So whenever that happens, you can go in on the individual's chart. You can look at a box Cox transformation where lambda is zero. So that addresses the issue from a, a, a log normal point of view. And then also you can have a log normal probability plot and then make the statement below it on how it's actually performing. 
Now when you're making transformations like this, I think it's really important to have a transformation that makes physical sense. You know, sometimes people will go in and use a box Cox transformation and they get a lambda 3.2. You know, I don't know what that physically is. So I tend to be biased on what kind of transformation I might want to use for a particular situation. You know, now and and then I'll put that transformation in there. Now if it's got a, a knee in the curve, you know, then that's a, a big flag to me that I maybe have two different distributions and I need to talk about them separately. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, I do have another question here. If attribute data defective rates get small, um, would we think that a zero could be within the upper and lower? We would think that a zero could be within the upper and lower control limit charts. Um, obviously, a minus defective rate is not possible. But what would you do to address the situation? Yes. Okay. Again, that's a similar situation, and and I don't like you know for thirty thousand foot level reporting, we don't want to go in and use a p chart, and there's some technical reasons for that, and I can uh, send a link that kind of describes the issue with that. So I'm using basically an individual's chart. Now I'm assuming that the uh, size of the sample that we're having for each of the intervals is approximately the same you know when I'm doing this and if you're going in and doing this plot of the the rates then you can often have zero within the limits and one way I prefer to do that is take a transformation and a lot of times a square root transformation is uh, a good transformation appropriate for uh, binary binary kind of data uh, where I'm dealing with percentage of non-conformances. And, okay. and typically then, then the thing is also the capability is if you've got the subgroup sizes all exactly the same, then the, I mean, excuse me, if the, the number of opportunities for each of the, the subgroups is the same, then the failure rate would be the center line. That would be your best estimate. And if it's not, uh, the same, then you could look at for that recent region of stability of the total population that you had for opportunities and divide that into the number of failures and that's a little bit of a better estimate for the uh, capability of that particular process on how it's performing right now. Okay, that was a pretty comprehensive answer. Um, Thank you. And somebody is asking, what are the most common types of transformations that you use other than the Box Cox transformation? Well, the, the transformation that I use, you know, probably the most is the uh, the Box Cox. Now, uh, where in it's in particular with lambda zero, you know, I the log normal applies a lot, but the tendency or the thing that I've seen occur a lot of times is we tend to force a fit that doesn't make physical sense and and a lot of times what it is is there's more than one distribution so if something seems like it should take a log normal distribution in other words you think it should have uh, be skewed so it has a long tail to it then I would go with the log normal distribution and then start looking at the other um, issues that you might have and it may be coming from a bim bimodal distribution. Now the problem you can have with a log normal distribution, it doesn't like minus numbers. So you can maybe then have a three parameter a log normal distribution. You know, and when you might incur this is that you're looking at on time delivery where zero would be on time and minus one would be maybe one day early. So then you could go in and use a, a three parameter log normal distribution to go in and uh, look at that data and I think that that typically is a is got a good fit and if you again don't fit something that's naturally I, I tend to start thinking about well maybe you got you know um, a bimodal distribution that that you need to separate those distributions out to really make a capability statement. 
we had one uh, you know, class just recently we talked about that this would have been how long does it take to actually uh, do a change order. You know, well, a lot of them were zero. It took less than one day. And then some other ones, it took greater than one day. So basically, we lumped them into did it take less than one day, and what percentage was that, and then if it took longer than one day, then we tracked that over time, and that was, had a nice probability plot to it. And so now you could basically combine both of those distributions and basically um, state how your process of performance. And what it boiled down to is you had some things to do that were real easy and you got done in less than a day and things that took longer than one day, this is the kind of distribution you could expect. So that would be an example of a, a two different distributions that need to be talked about when you're talking about capability of the process. Okay, so it sounds like a, a lot of times it's just uh, case dependent. Um, somebody else is saying that the uh, 3,000 foot level metric, um, the examples that you've shown um, have been very helpful. Um, can you provide an example of where the 30,000 foot level metrics have been used um, to gain additional um, insight? Yeah, the exam example that I was even uh, talking about, you can go in and look at the, uh, if I come in here to, uh, Okay, these are some actual examples that we have. So I'm I'm moving going to the website here and if and I'll just click here, I'll send you this link too if you're interested. And uh, so I'm I'll be showing you some examples here. So this is how you talk about looking at out the windshield of cars, what you want to do. If you don't, you can have some things that look bad. So this would be uh, uh, an example that you might have here. This was a table of numbers. Uh, this is another actual dashboard that somebody had. As I mentioned, I had four different situations here. Okay, this is uh, looking at wastage, how they did it, and then I went in and looked at it. This is the example I actually showed in the chart in the the webinar here. You know, but I talk about it a lot more there. And let's look at another one here. So this is uh, another report out that somebody had as a performance indicator. And then I started looking at it, time series report out. And then I identified, hey, it looks like he got a special cause. Then this is another one he looked at here. But notice here, now I'm making a statement of how the process is performing. So these are actual scorecards that somebody gave me. Now notice on this one here, we believe it looked like it changed. So we staged it. But the point is, is by looking at the traditional scorecard, the way they have it here, it's really not actionable. You know, like what do you do with it? So if somebody were to go to this side, then they would see eight different examples of how you could uh, show others and understand yourself the advantage of 30,000 foot level reporting over traditional scorecards. Okay, hopefully, thank you. Hopefully that answered the question. I think so. So I'm, I'm not seeing any more questions um, coming in at this time. Uh, perhaps if the attendees um, have any further questions or, as you said, if they maybe want to uh, get that link or a copy of your slides in PDF form, um, they can send you an email, correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, that's um, very generous of you, so thank you. Um, a recording of today's webinar will be available within a few days on the Statistics Division's YouTube channel. And you can visit our channel at youtube.com slash ASQ 
that division. And um, please be sure to share this uh, webinar with uh, your friends, family, coworkers, colleagues. Um, and you can also view our archived webinars on our YouTube channel as well. Um, I would also encourage you to check out the division's LinkedIn page. It's a great way to connect with others in the statistics field. Um, also, I'd like to invite you to view our events calendar at asq.org slash statistics for the latest news on our webinars, conferences, and many other topics. Um, since there are no further questions, I suppose we will end here. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you again, Mr. Bry Fogel, for um, presenting with the Statistics Division. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you.